In this final chapter, a rare variety of images will be featured to realize some of the functions that drawing had in the 16th and 17th centuries. Topics include drawings for art collectors, transfers, studies for paintings, counterproof, documentation, costume and ornament designs, interior embellishments, drawing as a pastime, and drawing for amusements. This detailed drawing by Lucas van Leyden from the early 1500s demonstrates that a drawing could be a beautiful masterpiece in itself. Such works would be highly coveted to the art collectors of his day and may have been drawn just for that purpose. Notice the skilled manner of hatching applied in both the lights and shades, with some masterly areas of transparent and opaque washings providing warm and cool tones to achieve a greater third dimension. Darker touches of ink in the skull, hand, and crucifixion help to project these forward while lighter shadows recede back. This elaborate marine scene by Wilhelm van de Velde is a pen and ink drawing on a prepared white panel. Known as pen paintings, this one is rather large in size, 29 and a half by 41 and a quarter inches. Such a drawing of this magnitude was a 17th century rarity and was likely commissioned for a high-ranking naval commander who may have participated in this historic event of the Dutch fleet departing in 1645. Van de Velde relied on first-hand experience as an artist. He accompanied the fleets and sketched naval engagements as they happened, depicting the sea victories over the Spanish, English, and Swedish in his paintings. The thousands of preparatory sketches made by Van de Velde and his son are still invaluable for naval historians. The Dutch artist Albert Kuyp perhaps completed this dead color drawing, a view of the city of Dordrecht, for his art dealership business. The work would have appealed to its in city inhabitants, or perhaps would have been purchased by a visiting traveler as a document or remembrance of his or her journey. Today, of course, we have cameras to fulfill this purpose. From a 1674 English drawing book, we see an example how to draw a picture bigger or lesser exactly alongside an ink drawing to the left squared for transfer. The square transfer was a convenient method to enlarge or reduce a drawing onto a panel or wall and is also explained in European Artist Heritage Lecture Series No. 1, Chapter 2. In a busy workshop producing large murals, as in Italy with its frescoes and in France for the king's palaces, this transfer method was highly practical. The master would execute the original drawing and square a grid on top so that hired assistants would lay in a larger grid on the wall through either snapped chalk lines or lightly drawn ruled lines. Once the drawing was copied square by square, the master would then step in and finish the painting. Here are two drawings that had been squared for a wall design by the French master Simon Foyet. Foyet studied and rose to prominence in Italy before being summoned by King Louis XIII to serve as court painter. He and his studio of artists created religious and mythological paintings, portraits, frescoes, tapestries, and massive decorative schemes for the king and Cardinal Rishnu. His most influential pupil was Charles Laburn, who organized all the interior decorative paintings at Versailles and who dictated the official French art style during the formation of the Royal Art Academy in 1648. Laburn, jealously excluded Voyette's participation and membership into the Royal Art Academy. Over the years, Rembrandt sketched several poses from female models 
for the painting idea of Susanna and the Elders, producing two known paintings of the theme. As was characteristic of his working method, Rembrandt likely made this drawing from the life in preparation for alterations while the painting was in progress. In the drawing, the black chalk has been applied in subtle variations, soft for the flesh tones and bold for the drapery, with darker marks emphasizing facial expression and the gripping tension of the hand. Rubens also produced a drawing from the life as reference for his famous painting in the Cathedral of Our Lady in Antwerp. The process of a counterproof can be explained in this drawing. The technique began by dampening a blank sheet of paper, pressing it against the original completed chalk drawing of the kneeling man. Removing the damp paper, a blurred reverse image or the counterproof is created. While the paper was still damp, some darker touches of red chalk were apparently applied. This can be seen along his face, in the eyes, nose, and mouth, along the fingers, under the armpit, and in the drapery and feet. Note in the close-up detail of the feet that the direction of the hatching goes from top left to bottom right when compared to the hatchings of the hand study, which was drawn later directly on top after the paper had dried. As an anatomical artist, Michelangelo's drawings were made available for scientists to adopt into their manuscripts. Such sketches were widely reproduced through the counterproof method from the lost Michelangelo originals. Here, another Renaissance method would create a reverse image. The verso side of the drawing, being blank, was possibly traced with the recto side against a window pane so that daylight would reveal the outlines through the paper. This would be a process similar to the use of today's light box. The reasons why an artist would execute an image in the reverse are rational. Perhaps an image was needed for another painting idea that required a figure to be in the opposite direction, or if creating a detailed drawing for a print publisher, seeing the drawing in reverse would help the artist to better judge the outcome of the composition before it would be printed. The latter reason is applied here. Van der Hayden produced multiple prints of townscapes, so he likely employed counterproof drawings often. In this one, he first drew the building, canal, and tree on the right in black chalk only as outlines and then he applied a blank, dampened paper on top to produce the faint, blurred, identical image in the reverse as seen in the drawing at the right. The Dutch master proceeded to finish the first drawing on the left in gray washes and brush, while in the counterproof he added the details of people engaged in the setting. This is a winter scene. The figures in the foreground are on ice, apparent by the skates they are wearing. Notice also that van der Hayden drew his figures first in black chalk and then detailed them with ink washes and brush. Of interest, van der Hayden was first trained as a local glass painter. The difficult and irreversible technique of painting images on the back of a sheet of glass enjoyed a certain popularity at the time, and several works of this type by van der Hayden have survived. Though known for his quiet cityscapes and still lifes, Jan van de Heyden was not only an artist, but also an inventor, a city official, and an entrepreneur. In 1670, he was appointed by Amsterdam's city council to oversee the installment of over 2,000 street lamps of his own design, which remained in use until the 1800s. In 1673, he assumed the responsibility for the city's fire brigade and, with his brother, invented a new, highly successful watering-pumping mechanism 
and fire hose. He later wrote, illustrated, and published the first known firefighting manual, of which this drawing served as one of the etchings. As a young man, Van der Hayden witnessed the burning of Amsterdam's old city hall, which left a deep impression on him to study the nature of fires and their overwhelming destruction. This drawing illustrates the aftermath of a warehouse fire, of which he would have likely investigated and explored the ruins to understand the cause of the fire. Van der Hayden would die a very rich man, yet he never acquired Amsterdam citizenship, neither did he join the Amsterdam Painters Guild. These drawings served as design ideas, one for a costume, the other of an armored head covering for a knight's horse to wear during jousting tournaments or festivals. These two ornamental designs were drawn by Adam van Viennen, a leading Dutch silversmith who trained as an engraver. He would specialize in producing ornate silverware, candlesticks, platters, and medallions. Many of his silver works are likely depicted in Dutch and Flemish still life paintings. Bernard van Orley was the preeminent tapestry designer of the early 1500s in the Netherlands. This elaborate drawing was for a famous series of tapestries now destroyed. Known as the Nassau genealogy, the elaborate wall hangings portrayed the splendor of the lineage of the House of Orange, Nassau, from 1200s to the 1500s. In his popular 1604 book, Het Schilderbuch, Karl van Mender mentions the very beautiful and richly painted cartoons by this artist. This interior design for a palace wall may have been made for Pope Alexander VII, for it features the Chahigi family emblems of oak leaves and the eight-pointed star, and includes depictions of the Pope's building projects at Castile Gandolfo outside of Rome. Schorr, the artist, finished his training in Innsbruck and settled in Rome to specialize as a decorative designer. It was customary for artists to travel throughout Europe after their training and to settle in townships where their art expertise would ensure them a good reputation and therefore steady, lifelong work. The most secure jobs were under the patronage of royalty or powerful wealthy clerics. Otherwise, one had to either establish their own workshop business or find employment, usually temporary, under another master who was overburdened with many commissions and or major projects, like decorating the walls or ceilings of a palace, which required compositional designs of grouped themes. Even the German artist Albrecht Dürer employed himself to the task of design work in his drawing at the left for the town hall of Nuremberg. The French artist Dubriel lays out the design for both a ceiling and wall embellishment. Rembrandt drew all the time and direct from the life. The mother and child relationship was a source of endless fascination for him. In a few confident lines, he captured the emotion of a baby's first steps, or the fear in one child's face of a nearby dog, or the expressive frustration of another child wanting to avoid a pestering dog. Note also the tender expressions emphasized upon the faces of the mothers, all keenly observed and felt by the Dutch master. Rembrandt himself had five children, but only two would survive past their first year, Titus and Cornelia. Neither child apparently had the natural inclination to be artists. Rembrandt often painted Titus, who died at the age of 37, a year before Rembrandt. 
Cornelia was only 15 years old at the time of her father's death. Cornelia and a son of Titus would continue the family line, which has since become lost through time. Drawing outdoors was also enjoyed by picture drawers, as demonstrated in these ink drawings with watercolor washes by two Flemish masters. The top is by Jan Bruegel the Elder of the city of Heidelberg and its castle. The bottom is by Peter Paul Rubens of Castle Kreuenhof. Both drawings appear likely as illustrations for their own personal travel journal. Notice the simplicity of line and the soft glow of European atmospheric light captured in the open air by both artists. This sketch by Peter Paul Rubens could possibly be his favorite riding horse, drawn from the life. Rubens apparently was an excellent horseman. In 1603, working on behalf as a diplomat to the Duke of Manta, the artist was entrusted to escort seven exceptionally beautiful horses to Spain as gifts for King Philip III. Based on his correspondence with the French art critic Roger de Peel, Rubens' nephew recounted that his uncle usually finished his day with a ride at five in the afternoon outside Antwerp and recalled that, health permitting, Rubens enjoyed relaxing by riding a fine Spanish horse. Such is portrayed in this drawing, complete with a 17th century Spanish bridle and saddle. Satire books illustrated with caricatures were popular for public enjoyment. However, caricature drawings were doodling times for an artist's private amusement. Such scribbles served an important exercise to sharpen their observation skills by immediately recognizing the individual features, unique postures, or distinct dispositions of people, especially if the artist was a portrait painter. Pierre Francesco Mola represents clerics and priests in these doodles. Mola spent most of his life in Rome and apparently traveled throughout Italy. He was a prolific draftsman, drawing and painting for pleasure, but he is best known for his witty caricatures. Nesseron was a French mathematician, Catholic friar, and a painter with a passion for investigating perspectives. He wrote a groundbreaking book in 1638 called Curious Perspectives, which assured his place among scientific and academic societies. He was a native of Paris, but traveled widely throughout Europe and was awarded a professorship in Rome. He is known for his anamorphic drawings as seen here. The original was made on a large sheet of thick laid paper approximately 15 by 20 and a half inches. The distorted ink drawing was copied from an engraving by Hendrik Goltzius. Leonardo da Vinci is known to be perhaps the earliest known artist to create anamorphic images. In the 18th and 19th centuries, anamorphic images were used more as children's games rather than Renaissance amusements in high societies. Today, some artists have renewed the technique of anamorphosis into stunning outdoor insulations and murals. This concludes the seven-chapter lecture series on 16th and 17th century drawing, instruction, process, and purpose. I hope this art appreciation course has inspired and enriched and enlightened you. Keep not this newly acquired knowledge to yourself. Please let others know about European Artist Heritage, available for free viewing worldwide to anyone, anywhere, anytime. Thank you for watching.